सुन रहा है हूँ सदा कैसे कहूँ मैं पत्थर बहुत है फूलों के रस ते जा ओ साथी रे इन राहों को तू जान We are, you know, I do represent Ryerson University and it is uh, very important for us as an institution to start any sort of gathering anywhere, at any place, whether it's on our campus or not, with an acknowledgement that we are gathering here on indigenous lands. These are the traditional territories of indigenous peoples. We are here without invitation on this territory. We have come here as settlers in different ways and under different circumstances. But it is always important that we find a way of connecting in our own hearts, in our own minds, and most importantly in our actions, with a long history of not having connected well, in fact having connected in very socially unjust ways with this land and with the people who have inhabited this land for a very, very long time and continue to do so. I could read a statement to that effect, but I would much prefer that you, in your own way and in your own reflections, think about what that means to you. Um, because I don't want to just create a routine of reading statements in this regard. I do very, very much want to welcome you, and I want to emphasize that, um, that we are particularly pleased to have brought together people who perhaps under different circumstances don't come together that often. From the perspective of Ryerson University, it is such a pleasure to welcome so many of you representing communities with which we wish to be much more closely associated. Um, we are, we are, so this is really a great moment for us, and I invite you after this event, there are many people here from Ryerson, myself included, to connect with us so that we can uh, move forward and do lots of other things together in lots of different ways. We're really, really excited about that prospect. I want, to, um, I want to acknowledge some very special guests who, um, who it's a real, real honor that, um, that some people uh, who we all know have very busy schedules have taken out the time um, to join us. I want to um, first of all welcome Senator Salma Ataulahjan. Um, It is really quite, uh, we're really, really pleased that you were able to make it. So thank you very much, and I will ask you to say a few words in a, in a couple of minutes. So that's really wonderful. I, uh, I also would like to uh, welcome um, a member of Provincial Parliament, Joe Andrews, who uh, has come. <laughs> and again, we know that's a busy job too. So, uh, so thank you very, very much for being here. It's a real pleasure to, uh, to have you here. Um, we have also 
you know, this event, while, the, while I'm co-hosting it with my amazing colleague, about whom I will say something in a moment, um, I just want to first of all acknowledge um, a guy who really did all the legwork on making this thing happen. And so, um, Dr. Muhammad Hamid is a, uh, is a wonderful person who, uh, who really um, just really went out of his way to, uh, to create so many parts of this particular event. So, so thank you. Um, thank you for that. We have some, uh, as, a, as a person from Ryerson, it's always my pleasure to say a special welcome. Okay, now I gotta be careful, it's not too loud. <laughs> to say a uh, special welcome to colleagues from the other university in Toronto, down the road, the University of Toronto. And so we have a number of people here. We have Professor Shahid Hussein. Shamir. Shamir Hussein. I'm so sorry. No, Shamir Sheikh. Shahid Hussein. Yes, so first I said Shahid. Okay. And then I said Shamir. There you go. Okay. And we also have Samir from the Canadian Pakistani Business Council and I would like to welcome you and we've already agreed to go for coffee so the business is in the making okay that's very good okay so uh, you know it was a few months ago that I uh, met Sabahat Anis who really um, is quite an amazing person because uh, you know straight out of uh, out of her heart and um, out of her love for, uh, for the things she does, for art, for social justice, and so on, she came and really requested that we, um, that we work together to put on this particular um, exhibit of art that explores an issue that is very dear to her, and that is the issue of child labor. And so, um, over time, over the past few months, I've really um, gotten to know her as someone who's relentless and, uh, and surprisingly assertive in ensuring that things go exactly as, uh, uh, as they need to go. Um, but much of what you see here was curated, uh, actually everything you see here was curated by, uh, by Sabat. And, uh, and what a wonderful thing she has brought together. Um, so I will ask Sabat to speak in just one minute. Um, I just felt I shouldn't put it off any longer that I'm not the only host. So I felt really it was important that I speak to you. But we do have, um, uh, so I wanted a slight separation to, uh, to also introduce a very, very, another very special guest, um, which is the, uh, the Consul General of Pakistan, who is here, Imran Siddiqui. And I really wanted to, um, and I really wanted to sort of have a special moment to say welcome to you, because not only are you, were you the person who initially connected us, so thank you very much for doing that, um, but you are also an art lover, I understand, and somebody concerned about issues of social justice. So we are very, very happy to, uh, to have you, and it's an honor to have you here. Um, Anwar Saluchi is here as well. He's the Assistant Vice President uh, at Ryerson University. I don't know where you are, Anwar. At Ryerson University International, and also the Dean, the dean of the brand new Ryerson Law School. Um, to which you're all welcome to apply because it'll be the best law school in the country. So I just thought I'd mention that. I, um, so what we've put together here um, is a visual exploration of the issue of child labor. And um, you see the art, it is first of all aesthetically simply beautiful, but it also has deep meaning for the artists who have written about the meaning that this art has for them in a book that is available to all of you for free, that we put together so that you can uh, read about the artists and uh, read about why they painted in the way that they did. And they're really amazing stories that reflect so many different ways of seeing the world, of being in the world, um, and, of, uh, and of representing that world, and particularly of representing the issue of child labor through the visual arts. Um, we at the School of Child and Youth Care certainly believe that the arts are a very important component of thinking about children and young people, of thinking about communities, and of thinking about social justice. And so we were very pleased to be able to put this together. I, I also need to say that because we are academics and our, it is our job to be critical about everything, 
um, that of course there are many different ways of thinking about the issue of child labor. The immediate, emotional, intuitive way of thinking about the issue is that this is an absolutely horrible thing and we want children to have childhoods that reflect play, innocence, education and those kinds of things. But we recognize that the world is a complicated place and things often aren't quite as simple as they may at first glance appear. And so we will, on the one hand, really appreciate the, um, the artistic representation of this issue. And then later we will also hear from an internationally renowned scholar on this very issue and on the issue of children and youth rights more generally, Dr. Tara Collins, who's here, um, who will speak to us on this issue. Uh, in just a few minutes. Okay, I want, there are a number of people who are going to also give a welcome, but before we do that, I want Sabahat to come and say a few words. Um, because this is your, your time, and your moment, your place. Good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you all and thank you very much for being here today. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Kiras Kerabagi, the Director of Child and Youth Care at Ryerson University for co-hosting this exhibition, and John C. Eaton, Chair of Social Innovation, Faculty of Community Services at Ryerson University, for their collaboration <coughs> in this event. It is wonderful to have their support in advocating for this important cause, and we look forward to learn more about this uh, global uh, child labor from keynote Dr. Uh, Tara Collins. Um, in addition, uh, I would like to give a special thanks to Senator Salma Ataullajan, um, MPP Jill Andrews, Councillor General of Pakistan Imran Ahmed Siddiqui, um, uh, Maliha Shahid, I think she is not here yet. Uh, for attending this exhibition and sharing their thoughts on International Child Labor Day. Um, after my graduation, I've been working in schools uh, with, chil with children. That brings me close to the ch children. And um, so my passion and drive to support them uh, comes very naturally to me. Uh, the Sabat Gallery and, um, had their artists tackle this topic and its role in developing as well as developed countries. Um, at the end, uh, Sabat Gallery, on behalf of all participants, uh, would like to acknowledge, thanks, and praise the continuous hard work done by individual organi uh, organizations, NGOs, uh, the government legislator, to help uh, eliminate this form of child labor. This is our small contribution um, for this big social issues. We hope to provide a strong message and inside action in support of children of the future. Thank you very much. Senator, may I ask you to say a few words? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Sabah initially got in touch with me and said, would you do this? And I said, yes, I will, because I don't know how many of you know, but I'm originally from Pakistan, and Pakistan is one of the countries where we are dealing with child labor, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get into that issue. You have experts here. Um, but in my capacity as um, Vice Chair of the Human Rights Committee in the Senate, whenever we do studies, like I sponsored a study on the garment workers, who I thought would be mostly young women. Well, the children who are also working in the garment uh, you know, industry, in, and I, we specifically looked at Bangladesh, but when I checked, it's throughout uh, you know, Asia um, that there's an issue there with children working. So, Sabawat, I want to thank you for bringing this very important topic forward, and I'm here to support you. I'm, I'm heading off to Uganda at 9 a.m. in the morning, and I, I still haven't packed, and, but I said, you know, Sabawat, what you're doing, I have to show my commitment because, you know, I stand for, you know, social justice. We stand for the rights of, you know, young people, old people, everyone. We, we have to support each other. So this is my way of supporting you for the important work you do. And thank you for that work that you do because it, 
you know, we're aware of the problem, but we need someone to shine a light on it. And that's what you're doing this afternoon. And for, to all the artists, thank you for this wonderful art. It's really breathtaking. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Our pictures like when we go to Pakistan you, you drive around and this is what you see you you don't notice because I think to having grown up you're so used to it but when you take a picture or paint a picture and you bring it and we look at it and you look at the harsh reality and you look at that child's expression and you say they deserve better so thank you to everyone who has taken the time to come Council General Professor Shamim, Professor Shahid and my friend uh, Jill. Jill. We met, met yes, last, last uh, summer in Ottawa. It's last summer in Ottawa. We were together again at the, yes, yes. At the women's conference. Um, Samir Dosal, who calls me to task, because I was a couple of minutes late. I, I was driving downtown. <laughs> so, um, you know, and I have to apologize. I will be leaving a bit earlier because I have to go and, 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 and get ready. But uh, I thank all of you, and I will get an update from Sabah later on. And thank you so much. Thank you. Jill, would you like to say a few words? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we doing today? Are we excited about the work? Uh, we understand that it is both uh, beautiful work, it is passionate work, it is also sombering work that also, uh, you know, sheds a light on, on a very complicated, nuanced uh, issue of child labor. Uh, so my name is Dr. Jill Andrew. I am the MPP for Toronto St. Paul's. I am a member of the NDP official opposition, and I'm also the culture critic along with the women's issues critic. So this work intersects uh, beautifully when we talk about using art as a social justice tool you know, as a lens in which we can champion and fight towards equity and inclusivity. Uh, this is at the heart of what I want to do as a newly elected politician, and I'm certain that it's at the heart of what all of you um, as academics, as elected officials, as senators, as artists especially, uh, want to do is try our best in whatever capacity we are in to shed the light uh, to raise awareness uh, to those who are furthest from the center of quote-unquote power. Um, I began my career, my post-secondary career, post career as a child and youth worker, uh, having graduated at Humber College. So children, uh, child development, child empowerment have always been very important to me. Uh, so I just want to say thank you very much to both of you for curating and organizing uh, this fantastic event. Um, I too will have to leave uh, shortly to get to another commitment and a canvas. It is a federal election coming up. Uh, but I do also want to, to remind folks you know that this is a this is an election this is an election issue. You know, children, uh, child development, child advocacy. These are election issues and should be at every level of government. Uh, provincially, I can say there have been heinous cuts to the arts. As the culture critic, I will continue to advocate because this is the power of the arts. This is the power of the arts, and we must nurture this at all costs. Thank you very much. I did not know you were a child and youth worker, so I feel very connected to you right now. I just want you to know that. Okay, thank you. I should also point out that we're holding this event on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the School of Child and Youth Care, by the way, so we've been around for a while. <laughs> Consul General, would you mind saying a few words to us as well? Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum and a very good evening to you all. Uh, first, of all uh, first of all, I would like to thank a few individuals who have uh, been a great help to me personally since my arrival in Toronto. I would like to thank Anwar Saluji Bhai, who is the Vice President of uh, uh, Ryerson University. Since the time I came, he held my hand and he has been guiding me on a number of issues. 
and under his guidance we have achieved something not with Ryerson but another you know with other universities and the research institutions and this is because of my interaction and his support to me thank you very much and I'm really very grateful to uh, you know uh, Senator Salva Ataullah who has always been very kind to the consulate to Pakistan community over here uh, through words through deeds she has been a great support to all of us at the same time I'm really grateful to uh, MPP Jill and Trius for her very thoughtful comments I was just discussing it with uh, with the uh, with our friends over there, Dr. Shamim and, and Shahid, that since the, since the fall of the left, people have started, uh, people have, uh, you know, stopped finding beauty in, in, in the issues which are related to, to the labor class, to, to, uh, which are related to widespread poverty. But I am happy to, uh, to, to hear very good and illuminating comments by uh, MPP Andrews that, yes, there is beauty in, the, in this form of art also, only we have to uh, be concerned and connect with, with the real issues which are related to inequity and injustice. You see, as a Pakistani and as a Pakistani diplomat, I joined uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs like two dec dec decades ago, but before that I, was, I, I worked with an NGO that, uh, uh, as a volunteer that uh, was dealing with the, the issues of development. And I could uh, easily connect myself with the, uh, with the issue and I see it, I mean, it is a human rights issue, but I, I, I look at this issue more as a development issue, as an economic growth issue, and various you know, um, uh, distor distortions which are associated with the growth uh, uh, trajectory. Uh, Pakistan is, as far as human rights of the children are concerned, Pakistan uh, was one of the five countries, initial five countries, that had issued the call for the right of the child. And because of that call, it was issued on behalf of Pakistan by Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto at that time in the early 90s. And because of her activism, ultimately the United Nations General Assembly adopted the right of the child, Convention on the Right of the Child. But in addition to it, uh, um, I mean, uh, I am proud of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, effort by, by our leaders. But that is at the same time, I'm also concerned about uh, the problem which are still, I mean, there uh, and affecting the lives of millions of children everywhere. Not only, uh, you know, middle-income countries or uh, least uh, developing countries, but also, upper, you know, uh, upper-level income countries and, and also the developed countries also. The ch children's poverty is an issue. This issue has to be addressed. This, I am not one of those who usually try to hide their, um, hide themselves, you know, uh, uh, behind the cultural particularities or national particularities of issues when it comes to the implementation of the human rights. Human rights are universal and indivisible. But I would like to remark over here uh, uh, something about uh, the differential that exists in the economic development patterns and the way the international uh, economic bodies an international trade system supports, you know, uh, the domestic uh, uh, growth trajectories, and ultimately how they affect, uh, you know, millions of people and children are part of it. There are social issues also, but there are economic issues. Um, in in several developed countries, I think there is an argument which I heard in the United States once, uh, at the United Nations, where the U.S. I think uh, representative spoke about it. He said that the the children who are working at the workplace with their parents are the are the ones who are, I mean, who are safe, do not have, the, they are protected, they are better, they get some, they learn something while they are working there, um, some vocation, something like that. And coming from the most developed, I mean, the developed part of the world, this kind of argument, I wonder myself as to, I mean, the country like Pakistan or other large, you know, uh, population developing countries, uh, where we have millions of children and perhaps we cannot afford, you know, provide them with uh, high quality education or enable them to enjoy all their rights as enshrined in the, in the con in, in, in respective conventions. What would be our position? I mean, uh, we need, do we need a, a, a kind of a high jump from this state to the one that is there in some, for example, Scandinavian countries, or is it a historically, um, I mean, there is an evolutionary process involved in that. 
uh, in the West, we have seen that it has been an evolutionary uh, process, and I would not like this process to be repeated in my context also. No one would like the children to suffer the, uh, the way Oliver Twist suffered, of course. But at the same time, we have to be just in our approach as far as an equitable international economic order is concerned. As far as uh, uh, the movement of labor from the developing countries to the developed countries, uh, it's is a big issue. We are large population countries. If you impose barriers on the movement of labor from the developing countries to the developing I mean, it, 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 it basically, I'm saying this because I am in a developed country. When you do that, when you impose, you know, create barriers on the movement of labor, you are contributing to poverty in that country. And you are affecting, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically you are deepening uh, poverty in various levels of societies. And uh, I mean, this is something that we need to think about. Uh, you can't just uh, go away and say that there is corruption, there is misgovernance, uh, and uh, you improve your misgovernance, your you know, governance, and uh, you address, you know, uh, corruption, and all your problems will go away. I mean, everything is connected. Everything is very well connected. Economic underdevelopment is connected with the international support mechanisms. And there is a whole history about it as to how developed world became developed world after, or after uh, the start of colonialization, uh, colonialism and how the colonialism perpetuated the concentration of wealth in the developed part of the, uh, of the world and it made us poor. And because of that, we suffer from so many social issues, so many economic issues, and so many security issues today. Um, and the rise of fascism in my neighborhood is one of them. So once again, thank you very much for, uh, uh, for inviting all of us, my wife and I. I uh, really enjoyed watching, you know, all this beauty which is there, which is painful also. But there is beauty in, this painting, in these paintings. And I'm one of those who believe uh, uh, in the purposefulness of art. It's not art for the sake of art or art for the sake of beauty. It's for, I mean, I see, I myself am a mature artist. So I always try to, uh, to, to find some message in my, whatever I create. So, uh, so, uh, so I can easily and uh, delightfully, you know, connect with whatever uh, I witnessed today. Thank you very much, Sabha. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Kiaras, uh, for uh, being so helpful to them and to all these artists. And I hope to, I hope to you know, continue my uh, dialogue with you on social issues. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Hello everyone, greetings, salam, bonjour. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all today. I want to thank Sabahat Anis for her excellent work. I want to thank all the artists who are here, are not here today, uh, for the sharing their wonderful work with us. Uh, also to the school and to the Chair of Social Innovation, of course, for the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, I have been asked to provide some child rights context with respect to today's um, exhibition and I am delighted to do so because uh, child rights are my passion. I've been living and breathing them since 1996 and it's a real pleasure to be here. And you might ask yourself, why am I here? Why are children's rights important? And um, I am going to um, offer some examples of that. Um, I want to rely, first of all, on Michael Freeman's words. He explains that rights are important because they recognize the respect that their bearers are entitled to. To accord rights is to respect dignity. To deny rights is to gas, cast doubt on humanity and integrity. And as such, I have been dedicated to children's rights at local, national, uh, regional, international levels in terms of research, study, advocacy, policy, and program work. And in essence, all of my work reflects the exhortation of this young person from Paraguay who was consulted and shared the importance for all of us to do more to better understand human rights and the implications that their actions have on, on, uh, on um, other people's lives. 
And so with that, I will be offering with you uh, a few uh, comments in relation to this. I think in terms of my background, my focus has been uh, more recently looking at the connections between children's rights uh, in the areas of child protection and child participation and expanding <coughs> traditional understandings of child protection. Um, done uh, leading work in, uh, with colleagues, including some here in this room, uh, with the International and Canadian Child Rights Partnership, which involves young people, academics, practitioners um, from different places in the world. and. Um, we are looked at the uh, connections in Canada, but also in China, Brazil, and South Africa. Um, I've also looking at the range of actors with respect to children's rights, including the non-traditional actors such as business. And so I bring some of this experience with, with with me today. And of course, we all need to be aware of and respond to the issues of uh, the worst forms of child labor. But I, I offer to you today that child rights help us understand the complexities and adv hopefully advance our understandings and follow up to the young people involved. So this visual art exhibit has been a very valuable um, uh, offering perspective is, perspectives about the issue of child labor. I have a great appreciation of visual arts. I am the daughter of a professional photographer. So so I've been surrounded by art throughout my life, um, my, and the photos from my mother are included throughout the presentation here today. Um, I also appreciate the art of my three boys, including this necklace that I'm wearing here today. Um, and I really acknowledge the incredible efforts that go into creating art. It's laborious, time intensive, deeply personal, and, and for most artists, and involves skills and abilities that I know I don't have. Um, but visual art is really really important in terms of illustrating realities that we may not be familiar with. And I have a good friend who's an artist. He also is from the Algonquin Nation. He helped me appreciate the significance of art. He talked about how it's sharing the greater world outside of our realities. And, and these art works have certainly done that. The global participation of artists highlights the universal significance of art. Did you know that there is a child right to artistic expression? It's included in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and it, it raises the question about the art of young people in our lives, and perhaps in future art of young people could be included in such exhibitions moving forward. But I want to offer for you the, the words of some young people who have consulted in an annual consultation, including here at Ryerson, uh, called Shaking the Movers. It's a rights-based participatory model. And uh, on the issue of artistic expression, young people said the following, art is determined by the artist, not the audience. And so, I want to ask all of us though, what is the role of children's rights in relation to the art subject matter? And also consider that art may not provide the full picture. The various pieces of art, excellent art that we've seen, have captured a moment in time and place, but don't necessarily give us all the details about the realities, the context, the issues that that young person or young people are experiencing. So therefore, I ask the following question, how do we care for young people? And of course, all of us are motivated in relation to child labor out of compassion. We um, are, have great feelings of sympathy and sadness for the suffering of, other, of, of others, and we want to help them. And that often leads to charity and desire to help people in need. Thomas Paine in 1792 outlined, quote, it is the nature of compassion to associate with misfortune. Alvin Finkel recently explored that there are competing notions, though, of the history of who deserves our empathy from those who can provide assistance, and differing approaches in efforts as to how to deal with inequality. And there are implications of gender, race, and class. So therefore, how do we practice compassion for others now in the 21st century? How does it connect with human rights and child rights? And if so, how? And child rights really asks us to respect the humanity of young people, while social innovation offers new perspectives on complex challenges. So therefore, moving forward, you may ask, what are children's rights? And they are essentially the human rights of children that should inform all issues concerning young people. 
and they reflect um, the inherent dignity and the inalienable, I think that jumped ahead, oops, oh no, uh, the inalienable, inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. So by virtue of being a member of the human family, by virtue of being born, no matter where you are in the world, you uh, are entitled to human rights. And they are understood as the fundamental foundation for freedom, justice, and peace in the world, according to various international instruments, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and as I will describe later, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Child protection is a very important right of child children, and it is a traditional right with respect to children, has been around in international discourse since 1924, when the League of Nations adopted the Declaration of Geneva. And there is a lot of support for protection, but it continues to receive overwhelming emphasis. And so I offer to you consideration for the contributions that the primary international institute for children's rights, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, a, a, and it identifies that children are all those up to the age of 18 years. And it, in essence, provides for three Ps, protection, participation, and provision of basic necessities of life. The convention highlights for us civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights, including freedom of expression, access to information, secure, social security, play, uh, protection from violence, etc. And the general principles highlight the importance of non-discrimination, best interests of the child, maximum survival and development, and the child participation. And these are rights in and of themselves, but also should inform how we understand children's rights. I love to hear the child voices out there. Yes, it's great. So, um, so while there is a fundamental challenge that remains with respect to implementation of children's rights, the CRC has brought around important changes with respect to how society should understand young people. They are not simply victims, but they have the agency and are important members of our community, society, and world. Today's climate change protests going on around the world are important evidence of that. There's been important, uh, it's while all children have rights, we also have to recognize diversities of young people with respect to age, maturity, development, circumstances, geographic location, and that requires sensitive attention. So our human rights must respect those diversities. And we also be, must be aware of systemic di discrimination, where uh, young people are at in terms of those with disabilities, girls, indigenous young, and racialized young people as examples. We must also recognize intersectionality, where young people are simultaneously positioned in two more of these or other categories that may change their experiences of systemic barriers. So thus, advancing children's rights is really important. And while there may be difficulties with respect to understanding the full spectrum of children's rights, I think we need to do our best to reflect that. And we also need to do more to raise awareness about children's rights. That is an obligation. So for today's presentation, I want to offer three key messages. The importance of child rights in relation to all issues related to young people. How advanced understanding of child rights may challenge our beliefs and worldviews and can reflect progress. And that young people have the right to participate in all concerns that, and that their perspectives must be considered. And in order to do that, I'll be looking at um, why children's rights are important, exploring the distinction between child labor and child work, and looking at the right to education and child participation. I will, of course, be doing that fairly briefly. <laughs> okay? Um, so it is important to note that, as I said, that children's rights reflect the inherent dignity. And we need to do our best to uphold the rights. Here are some more photographs of, uh, of children throughout the world. The 
In terms of how we should understand child labor, the International Labor Organization has defined it in a convention as relating to all forms of slavery, slave and trafficking, forced recruitment, prostitution and pornography, illicit activities, and any work likely to harm the health, safety, of morals of children. Child labor has certainly obtained a lot of attention in recent years. Um, certainly it's included in, a re in the Sustainable Development Goal. We have the Nobel uh, Peace Prize that was awarded in 2014 uh, um, uh, for a major activist in relation to child labor. And the issue remains though that there are 150 child laborers around the world. And what is important to recognize though in our efforts in trying to respond to child labor, that there tends to be an emphasis on the protection of children from child labor in isolation from the rest of their realities. And I think this approach is fairly simplistic, essentially saying that all child labor is wrong and doesn't consider the contributions of other children's rights and the role that child work actually has in the lives of young people. And so we need to think about the diversities of young people, their development, identity, and so on. I'm showering paper. Um, a recent international consultation involving young people about child labor around the world called Time to Talk highlighted an important lesson from engaging with young people from around the world is that we, there's a need to focus on gender and age differences. Child labor debates tend to homogenize children and childhood that there are major differences across young people. There also tend to be assumptions made, as I've learned in research, about children and what they need. And that can lead to problematic responses to young people. That young people tend to be disempowered from the situation. There's a famous example from Bangladesh. In, 19, in the early 1990s, the threat in the US of adopting what was going to be known as the Harkin Bill led to the dismissal of tens of thousands of child laborers in Bangladesh working in export garment factories. And the mere threat of that bill led to the dismissal and the thought was that because they would be out of child work that they would actually go to education. Well the reality is that the study research shows that in fact the vast majority ended up in much more exploitative situations. Uh, brick chipping, uh, maid service, and even prostitution. And, and the fact that they had much better supports, were earning more, eating more nutritiously, and had better use of health services by virtue of being in their positions of work. So I think that's important for us to be aware of. And another example of labor, the, the discourse around child labor has made folks on family farms in cocoa production in the past where they had carefully engaged family members in, um, in learning about how to work on family farms and not exposing them to harm, they are actually afraid of the, 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 the problems, of the, the problems that would be created. And so they're afraid of getting in trouble. And so they stopped involving their children even though the formation would have been, had included some valuable good components for their education and development over time. So I think it's important for us to think about the range of other child rights issues in relation to child uh, labor. As uh, the Vice Council pointed out to us, thank you, the importance of the colonialism. The anti-colonial theoretical framework highlights that we really shouldn't be considering any one interpretation of child rights as definitive for all contexts because that reflects a power imposition and that's problematic. And so I ask, are we forcing from our position of privilege only one perspective that child labor is wrong that ignores the diversity of young people's lives and contexts? Does banning child labor lead to marginalization? criminalization, or making lives worse. And uh, by no means, extreme poverty does it ever justify child uh, labor, absolutely the worst forms of child labor, or the denial of education. But we need to be mindful of the effects of our responses, and that's what I'm arguing. Research and international development practice have actually shown that there, we need to be mindful of a more supportive approach to young people who want to work and that short-sighted responses uh, should not, we need to pay attention to other, the range of arts that exist. 
with respect to that. So with that, I turn to child work. Negative understandings of child labor dominate. I did focus groups with young people in Canada with respect to some earlier... Oh, okay. No more moving. Got it. Um, okay. Um, I did focus groups, and there was a very strong understanding about how child labor is wrong consistently across the board among young people. And I think we need to think about the role of work in life. So I ask you, who here began, became a babysitter, for example, at the age of 12? Yeah, I did. Who here worked on a family farm from a young age? Anybody? Who here trained as a competitive athlete? Who here started work under the age of 18? Right? So it is understood that work is part of our lives from a young age. And it's important for us to understand that child work is any work that is done by young people in the informal or formal sector. And work is significant in terms of child, uh, child identity, the development of their identity, their family and community contributions that they're making through their work, and avoiding problematic outcomes. If a child's income makes a big difference with respect to whether a family has enough to eat, that's an important contribution that a child will often want, choose to make. And it often counters the argument in favor of total elimination as a result of that. And it's often, as my dear colleagues, one of whom is here in the room, Richard Carruthers, has pointed out in research, work plays an important role, and it's not a question of public awareness or regulation. Rather, it's families and parents and guardians seeing non-harmful work as significant to even young children as integral to their development. And there is the right to development for children that we need to be responsible for. So as such, we need to recognize the complexity of the issues. We need a more nuanced understanding of the issue. As a young person in Bangladesh highlighted, there it comes. Due to economic reason, children work at an early age in many countries like Bangladesh. And this young person explained, in this context, business companies should take initiative for establishing a training institute so that a, a children will get skill-based training and education. And business should take action for young children to get the opportunity for safe jobs according to the local law. But there, ten, there continues to be difficulties in the world in following up on this recommendation. So you may ask, though, what about the right to education? That is the common uh, question when we talk about child labor and how it compromises, the perceived perception that it compromises education. And I think around the world we have to recognize quality of education continues to be a real issue. And we cannot necessarily assume that school is the best or the safest place for young people in some contexts, instead of working. Um, as I pointed out to you before in terms of the Bangladeshi example, and we shouldn't necessarily think of education as mutually exclusive from work, right? There are many contexts where school and work are actually integrated. For example, in a study in Ashanti region of Ghana, most of the 84 children attending school worked on small-scale or family cocoa farms, but not necessarily to the detriment. In China, it, there, is a, um, uh, there is involvement of student or apprentice workership workers who do apprenticeships in factories. And that's been an important point. But it's important for us to realize the, 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 the connection between the two, that if a child is working, that necessarily means they're not getting education, has led to problems for young people. So colleagues Baudrillon and Myers has highlighted, for instance, in Zimbabwe, an educational scheme for child workers on a teak estate had been eliminated, and this was originally seen as a victory for rights groups. But then the situation of the child laborers didn't improve, as intended. And it's also worthwhile to point out that child laborers actually chose to participate in this scheme, and that was then eliminated. And another example is that valuable training programs for workers in Vietnam were eliminated even though that they were making major contributions to the uh, lives of young people, and actually can be a form of protection as well. So we need to think about how do we understand child protection and, and those actors who are working in the name of, uh, of child protection. There's not, there are challenges with respect to uh, innovation, 
due to the constraints of accountability frameworks and structured processes. We need to recognize that child work has economic, educational, and social reasons that won't go away just because we think child labor shouldn't exist. And that they can actually complement what is learned in this classroom and elsewhere. And also avoids social exclusion in the community. And actually 300 people in research identified, in, they were young people from Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Philippines, and Central America. 77% of these young people identified that they would prefer school and work to be integrated. And in fact, that's already happening here in the Toronto District School Board. It's through experiential work, experiential learning. Young people are being posted in placements in banking and finance, Canadian Armed Forces, hospitality and tourism, the Sunnybrook Hospital, among others. So it is part of our world. Why can't it be elsewhere? The, we also need to recognize, of course, that there are other options for families where desperate situations need to be avoided. So for instance, the Brazilian government has adopted an important Bolsa Familia, the family handbag, if you will, which is moving families out of poverty, reducing infant mortality, greater school enrollment is resulting as well. And it's attracting world attention. Numerous countries have sent experts there to study it. Now, the new president has, is not in favor of this program, and apparently changes are coming but I've just been confirmed from a, a, a Brazilian colleague today in the preparation that there is no way that they can get el eliminate that program because it is so important. So we need to think about the family's critical role as well as the government in reducing the economic imperative for children uh, in relation to the worst forms of child labor. So now I turn to the last item, child participation. This is a definition provided by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, and it explains to us the importance <coughs> of participation reflecting ongoing processes that include information sharing and dialogue between children and adults based on mutual respect in which children can learn how their views and those of adults are taken into account in decision making. And so we need to think about this in relation to child labor as well because there tends, continues to be a gap of the respect of the child's right in relation to this. Now, certainly some young people are involved in the global march against child labor, and we have to recognize that the most important lesson from uh, an international consultation on child labor identified that it's almost impossible to generalize or universalize children's views, but due to the diversities that I talked about before, but, the children's rights and business principles provided valuable insights um, from global consultations from over 400 young people from the ages of 7 to 17 and talked about how business affects their lives and helped elaborate the connection between business and their rights. But when we think about uh, other opportunities for young people, it's not always an easy uh, uh, step in Brazil, uh, sorry, in Bolivia. The, there was movement as a result of advocacy of working children's movements in that country that led to the lowering of the minimum age of work to 10 years old for those interested in working for themselves or their families. And this was what the working children themselves wanted. But they got incredible consternation from around the world and uh, this highlights that participation may not lead to results that we're, as adults, comfortable with. And we have to be open to that. And we also should think about how, how we can move forward with young people in relation to that. In the United States, young people identified under the age of 18 the importance of entrepreneurship, which they believed was important to affect change, improve their conditions, and the conditions in their communities. And in Egypt, the promoting and protecting interests of children who work involved young people in the development of successful codes of content along with business actors. So these are all valuable examples about how children have other visions and have valuable contributions to make. And we need to be open to listen to them and work with them and find solutions that work for everyone. And that working children's participation is crucial for nuanced policy, program, and practice developments. And that we should consider the full spectrum of rights 
not just the right for it to be free from the worst forms, of, uh, worst forms of child labor. So in conclusion, I think there is a lot of room for improvement around the world with respect to child, the worst forms of child labor, absolutely. But I would also argue there is room for improvement in terms of understanding child rights. And varying interpretations of child rights are not to be feared or silenced, but they do identify the need for more dialogue and that we need to respect the complexities, the intersectionalities of young people and their specific particular context. And that we should also be aware that there are positive and negative motivations for business to engage child laborers in the first place. Negative publicity has had a significant role in terms of raising awareness in the mid-90s. And in the UK, for instance, companies have been skewered for the involvement of child labor in cocoa production. Businesses are afraid to be burned, so that's a type of negative motivation. But there are also positive neg uh, motivations as well that I want to point out to you. So for example, there was an individual who worked for IKEA. He became interested in child labor. And now, today, this organization has its own children's ombudsman within the business. And all of the staff are trained in children's rights. So this is by no means a perfect business, but it offers valuable insights into the possibilities. So while a fuller understanding of children's rights complicates our understanding and our responses to child labor, compassion for others shouldn't be about what we as adults think and as, uh, as necessary as caring human beings. Compassion for others involves respecting them and their human rights, including their views and their context. As Freeman reminds us, the language of rights can make visible what has been for too long suppressed. It can lead to different and new stories being heard in public. And so this is important, as Freeman talks about. Oh, and here are his examples, forgive me, of the working children's movements. These are a reflection of different uh, children who are active on uh, uh, working children around the world. So it's not located in just one part of the world. It is all over the world that working children are active in highlighting these <coughs> issues and the importance of their right to work. Okay? I think it's important for us to remember, as Michael Freeman highlights, for the powerful and as far as children are concerned, <coughs> adults have always been pow uh, powerful and rights are an inconvenience. So in moving forward, I think we have to highlight the role of social innovation that may offer guidance in terms of, a, a, as a problem-solving framework and different methodologies to apply to problem-solving that's hopeful, participatory, and asset-based. And it's not just for individuals or groups of children and youth, but for our communities and our jurisdictions to make progress in relation to child labor. Also, it's positive that an international research workshop took place last year that brought together varying uh, opponents to the debate around child labor, child work, and they were able to identify common concerns and common principles so that they could engage in future. So that is a very positive development because such dialogue is really key. So in summary, I just want to highlight again the importance of child rights in relation to all issues concerning young people, how advanced understanding of child rights may challenge our beliefs and worldviews, but that it also reflect progress over time. With this 30th anniversary of the Convention on the Rights of the Child this year, this is important that we progress from our understanding of child uh, labor since the mid-1990s when it became to very on, on the forefront. It actually was my first job in children's rights was to write a paper on the situation of child labor. So it's been quite a journey. And I think we also have to remember the importance of the child's right to participate and be considered. So in conclusion, how do we choose to act and show our compassion? We have the power to make choices in terms of how we understand and respond to child labor. Rather than simply deem it wrong or deserving of our charity, I urge you to consider a more nuanced, fuller, rights-based perspective. And, the, and I offer the following words from a young Peruvian young person. Do not take advantage of us. We ask you to be responsible. Do not support us because you feel pity for us. Instead, support us because we deserve it. We do not want gifts. We want you to be responsible. Thank you so very much.
Thank you very, very much. That was um, a lot to think about, really, and I hope that was useful for people to put some things in context as we continue to admire the art.